<coughs> right, so today we're, uh, we're past the uh, curriculum, basically, of the, uh, of the book. There is one more chapter that is of interest to us, but we're going to be using it. We're not going to be having lectures from it, basically. And that's chapter 18 of your book, which is uh, different kinds of symbols to use in a hydraulic schematic. <coughs> so I'm going to be pulling on that one. I'm also going to be using this one somewhat in our uh, lecture, because you also get hydraulics in this one. And what we're going to do now is, uh, uh, for this... Uh, first of the last lectures we have after the curriculum is that we're going to create a very simple hydraulic system. We're going to do the calculations that we need to do for, for uh, uh, a simple system. And then uh, hopefully next week we'll be having uh, four hours uh, on next Wednesday since I had to move uh, last Friday uh, due to being sick. <coughs> uh, we're going to have four hours then, so I'm hoping to do a, a little bit more complex system uh, on next Wednesday so that we, we get to do do a bit larger system. This one only has a cylinder in it. I'm hoping that the next uh, system is going to have a couple of cylinders and at least one uh, hydraulic motor and maybe even some length to the lines so that we have to uh, have to calculate some uh, some pressure loss in uh, in the lines and everything. So <coughs> but this one is a, a fairly simple system just to start us off to see how how it is that we actually do work on on uh, designing a system. So we're basically going to create a hydraulic log splitter. So basically when you're creating firewood, you have cut the, uh, the, uh, the tree in, into the correct lengths, so the timber of the tree. Uh, and then you're going to put it into this hydraulic log splitter, which is going to put some uh, pressure to it in the same axis as the, as the tree was. And then it's going to split it into several parts. Basically the same thing that you do when you uh, hit it with an axe. Uh, only now we're going to have, have machinery do it for us, so we don't need to sweat when we're doing it. So you can buy loads of these uh, on stores, and usually uh, they have a hydraulic piston that they're running, uh, and they have uh, an electric motor. So as you can see here, uh, distance uh, of pipes and hoses is not going to be a problem, be because we have a very short system, so the distance from all of our parts here is practically nothing. So we won't get to, to calculate any, any uh, loss, uh, pressure loss I in lines uh, on this one. So it's going to be a very simple, uh, simple system. One cylinder, we can even have it a single acting cylinder so that we have a, a spring in here that's going to make sure that it gets pushed back once, once we're done applying pressure to it. Uh, but we are going to need a couple of valves in order to have this one running uh, correctly. And we're also going to have to do what you always have to do when you're designing uh, a system is that we're going to have to just make assumptions as we go along. Uh, so basically, we call them assumptions when we're doing it in, in, uh, um, in a school uh, setting. Uh, at work, you decide. So here we assume that we're going to use a pressure of this many bars. Uh, if you're doing this in a work situation, you decide that you're going to use a pressure of that many bars because you're the one that's doing the designing. And if it turns out later on that you need more pressure than those bars, well, then you just decide to use a higher pressure. So, so it's not really a big problem uh, when you're designing stuff. Uh, it's not a problem until it's actually been manufactured. That's when it can be a problem, because it can be difficult to, uh, to change something afterwards. But so long as it's still in the design stage on your paper and you're working with it, you can switch around on uh, all of the variables that you want to until you get to, to the correct one. <coughs> so what we have running on this one is that we have, uh, I've pulled the, this information from, from this one actually, uh, which is for sale on some uh, web store. And the electric motor can supply two kilowatts of power uh, to our pump. And uh, we're just going to, uh, for the sake of having calculated, uh, calculated it, we're going to assume that we have a mechanical efficiency of 99% between the electric motor and the pump, which means that we won't get the full two kilowatts into our pump, so, so that we have to do a calculation there. We'll get to that one later on, but we're just going to assume that we have that one. There, there wasn't any particular information about that uh, uh, on, on this one, but uh, I'm just putting it in so that we get to, get to calculate it a bit. We're going to need 
a force of five tons being applied by, by the cylinder. So we're going to need quite a lot of force on it. And uh, we're going to need a cylinder speed of four millimeters per second. So uh, um, we might have to change that into meters per second as we go along when we're calculating, but four millimeters per second is what we, uh, what we want. We don't want this one moving too fast, and that has to do with health and safety. If you accidentally trap your hand uh, between the log and, and, and the cylinder, you don't want it moving so fast that you uh, don't have a chance to react and push the emergency stop button. So because if it moves too fast, it's just going to crush your uh, hand with five tons of force. So there won't be any hand left afterwards. <coughs> so uh, what we want is four millimeters per second. That's what this one has when you buy it uh, in the store. So, uh, so we want, want the same uh, for the one we're creating. So we're not creating this, this exact one, but something similar to this one. Uh, and we need a required cylinder motion of three, uh, 320 millimeters. So it needs to be able to extend the cylinder 320 millimeters in total. So th that's the minimum one. We could have a, a, a longer cylinder if we want to. So uh, that would allow us to split even longer logs if that was necessary. But usually the length of the logs are pretty determined by the sizes of, of the ovens that are going in. So that they usually approximately that length. I think there's actually an ISO standard uh, for the length of them, how long they're supposed to be. Uh, w when you're buying them from a store, there, there is a standard for them. <coughs> uh, uh, so uh, first we're going to look at the electrical motor. So we need, to, we need to put that electrical motor into our hydraulic schematics. Uh, so we need to figure out what's the symbol for an electric motor. So there, there are two ways uh, of doing it. Uh, we can either open up page 393 in this one, or we can start looking in uh, chapter 18 of the hydraulics book. <coughs> so in, in this particular one, I chose using this book. Um, one of the main reasons why I've, uh, why I've focused on using this book uh, when we're solving here is that this is a book that is very good to use in several different courses so it's nice to know how much information you can actually find in this one <coughs> so for me mechanical design one and two uh, and uh, quite a lot of other books uh, quite a lot of other, cor other courses uh, have information in this one so once we've uh, opened up page 393 in the blue book we need to locate the electric motor symbol. So we find this one here. So we can see it's a, it's a circle with a capital M in it, and then it has two lines going off from it. So the two lines are signifying the shaft of the motor, which is going to go into uh, connection with our, uh, with our pump. <coughs> so we place a symbol like that, somewhere on our hydraulic schematics. Usually we have pumps and motors and stuff like that, and the tank, we prefer to have that very far down uh, on our hydraulic schematics. And then we sort of build with different kinds of valves and then the end consumers, like the cylinder and stuff, we want that up top. <coughs> uh, some systems even use, uh, use a, uh, a tank symbol that covers the entire bottom here. So they basically just have one big tank so that they can put all of the return lines, they just put them straight down to, to the tank. So everything returns to the same tank. I prefer using the, uh, the smaller symbol so that wherever we have a, a valve or anything that has returned to tank, we just put a, a small tank symbol uh, beside it. It m makes it a bit cleaner because we don't have loads of long return lines uh, in our schematic. So it makes it a bit easier to follow what's, what's happening. You'll see that a bit later on as we're uh, creating this one. <coughs> Second off, it is nice to just set a cylinder that we're going to work with because we, we, uh, we don't know that much about the cylinder. We know a minimum length, we know a minimum force, and we know a set speed of the cylinder. The set speed uh, won't really matter that much when we are choosing a cylinder. What 
matters for the set speed is uh, choosing a, a uh, uh, flow control valve that is going to allow us to, to, to set the correct speed of the cylinder. But the force is directly translated from the size of the piston, so we need to know pressure and size of piston in order to, uh, to calculate the force that we're going to have. And we, of course, also need to know the length of the cylinder. So uh, we'll start off just by figuring out what symbol to use for the cylinder. And uh, as I mentioned before, we only really need a single acting cylinder in order to split the log because we could have a mechanical spring just push the, push the cylinder back afterwards. So as soon as we stop applying pressure to it, it's just going to be pushed back by the spring. Uh, but we are going to need, need a spring because it's going to be horizontally placed because it's lying flat. So there won't be any gravity. If we could have sort of strapped the log up top and had the cylinder move upwards in order to split it, it uh, wouldn't be very uh, safe health-wise because you would have logs flying everywhere afterwards, but it would uh, mean that we could uh, utilize gravity to, to return it because uh, the weight of the piston rod and everything would push it down into the cylinder again. But uh, since we don't have that, we have it horizontal, we're going to need a, a spring in it uh, in order to, to push it back. We could, of course, use a double-acting one where we used pressure on the piston rod side in order to push it back. But that's a more complicated cylinder to use. So uh, in a simple system like this, we do want to go for the simple solutions when we're creating it. It's uh, uh, one of the best tips I ever got when working with hydraulics uh, at Imenko. It was from uh, one of the technicians that we hired in from a, a Norwegian company named TESS, uh, which do uh, a lot of hydraulics work. They have, uh, they have uh, uh, huge vans driving around, which are basically mobile workshops where they have uh, equipment to bend pipes, they have equipment to uh, put uh, couplings on uh, connectors, on uh, hoses and everything, and cut hoses to the correct lengths, uh, so they can do all of the work from, from the car. And it was one of these technicians that uh, helped in one of the, uh, one of the um, um, uh, hydraulic systems that I worked on in uh, Imenko. And uh, what he told me there was basically this, that if you can keep it simple, keep it simple, because there is less things that can go wrong. So, so if, if we're putting in a double-acting cylinder, because we want to use hydraulic force to push, uh, push the piston back, it means that we have one more spot where we can have, uh, have trouble in our system, because we, we need to have another connection into the cylinder, and there might be trouble with that one uh, sooner or later. So... If we if we can if we can do it with uh, just a spring in there, that's going to be in fact the the lifetime of a spring that's inside a cylinder like that is probably much longer than than the lifetime of the cylinder itself. So most likely the cylinder is going to break before before the spring breaks. <coughs> so again, we open up page three hundred and ninety three. We could also have gone to uh, chapter eighteen uh, in the book. Uh, in the uh, hydraulics book. And now we need to figure out what kind of cylinder we're going to use. So we need a single acting cylinder with a return stroke by an integrated spring, is the name of it. And here we can see there are two symbols that they've put in. So they've put in one very complicated symbol, and then and they've also put in a simplified symbol there. <coughs> So we're, of course, going to use the simplified one when we're putting it in. We don't need more than the simplified one to show that this is a, a single-acting cylinder. <coughs> so we're going to put this one in here. And just in order to make everything fit, I'll put it all the way up here, because then I have room for the rest of the, the schematic uh, on mine here. Of course, if you're sitting sketching something like this by hand, uh, you don't have that much ability of moving around. While I was creating this one, I originally had my cylinder over here, then I moved it up there, and then after a while I had to move it over there in order to, to get room for, for all of the components that I'm putting in. Uh, which means that when you're doing it by hand, especially like on, on the exam and stuff, uh, you are probably going to get the, uh, at least one, uh, one task where you need to, to sketch a hydraulic uh, schematic. Uh, if you figure out that 
you put your motor and pump down here and you put your cylinder here and you suddenly don't have room for your for your valves and stuff then just draw longer longer lines don't don't bother actually creating everything anew starting fresh on a new sheet of paper in order to get room for everything just make sure that let's see So like in this case, if we had the motor over here and I had put my cylinder up here, and then of course I wanted some valves between here, uh, but I couldn't fit them when I was drawing, so I could draw my valves over here, and then I could uh, pull my lines over like that. So it's not, not a big deal I if you won't get it with the with certain stuff at the bottom and uh, the consumers at the top if you don't manage that on your uh, your drawing that's not a huge problem on, on the exam but a, a good tip is to try to uh, use too much space so that you're going to have too much space between your stuff so use an entire page when you're doing a sketch like that because that's uh, that's going to save you a lot of trouble with uh, with having it really cramped in one one spot so if you've written uh, a couple of lines on 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 the new sheet of paper uh, on on the uh, previous task, and you're starting on this one. Just start on a completely new paper. It's uh, you, you're not paying uh, for the papers anyway, so why not just use a new one <laughs> on the exam? It's going to save you a lot of trouble. <coughs> um, just one other tip before we continue: if you have lines crossing each other and they're not uh, not uh, actually connected. We usually use a, a circle to show that we're connecting two lines together. Uh, and if you have another line that's uh, coming here and it's supposed to cross over here, but it's not supposed to be connected to it, you can either just put it through there without a circle that's showing that it's just passing that line, it's not actually connected to it. Or, as some people do when they're creating these, they're actually doing a sort of jump across it, just to really make it clear that these two are not connected at all. So uh, exactly how you do that, if you need to cross lines, that's uh, up to you. According to, uh, according to this book, it's enough to use circles when you're connecting lines and then just drawing straight lines across each other when you're just passing. So it depends on what you, uh, what you want to use there. So we've figured out what symbol to use for our uh, cylinder. And we've put it into our schematic. And now we need to start really deciding what kind of cylinder we need to use. So we need to determine the dimensions of our cylinder. And if we open up page 402 in the blue book, you are allowed to bring the blue book to the hydraulics exam. So both the blue book and, and the... Uh, and the hydraulics book, uh, you can uh, bring both. <coughs> but uh, in the blue book, it sort of has uh, quite a lot of uh, different formulas uh, that are sort of really condensed, so it's easy to, uh, to, once you know where to look, it's easy to find them. So in page 402, we have uh, even a heading, hydraulic cylinders and hydraulic pumps to look at. So we can see here we have uh, piston forces up top here and we have piston speed uh, in the middle. So we want to look at piston forces to begin with. So I'm just going to uh, uh, zoom in on that one a little bit. <coughs> and now we need to make assumptions or in real life we would, we would have uh, made decisions uh, and decided what to use here. And one of the things we need to assume is what pressure are we going to use in our system. So uh, in a real situation, it might be that you already had a pump uh, ready, and then you would, of course, choose the operating pressure of that pump. In this case, we don't know what pump we're going to use yet. We're going to look at that after the cylinder. So we're just going to assume that we're going to work with a 100-bar system uh, in this case. 
And 100 bars, that's the same as 10 megapascals. And uh, we're also going to make the assumption, like they have done in the example here, that we have a, a uh, efficiency of 85%, so 0 0.85. Uh, that's just to give us an efficiency. Uh, if we had an actual cylinder gone into a catalog from uh, a supplier, then that efficiency might be 86, 87, 88, 89. It might be something completely different from 85, but then we would, of course, use the one that was referred to in, in the, the catalog from the supplier. Right now, we're just imagining a cylind uh, one cylinder that we're going to use that fits these criteria. And we are going to need a force of 5 tons, so 5,000 kilograms. Just to make it easy, I've uh, rounded off the uh, acceleration of gravity to 10 instead of 9.81, because then we get 50 kilonewtons. So we're going to have nice numbers to work with uh, on this one. <coughs> uh, and then we need to figure out the area of our piston. So we need to figure out the area on that side of the piston. And we need to use this effective piston force uh, formula, which uh, you can find in that book, where you have the force that you need, in our case 50 kilonewtons. We have the pressure of the si uh, system, PE. We had set it to 100 bars. Uh, we need to figure out what the area is supposed to be. And then we have the efficiency of the cylinder, which we set to 85% on this one. <coughs> so if we put in this part uh, for area in there, and then we solve it for the diameter, then we get uh, this one, where we put in the 50 kilonewtons, we put in the 10 megapascals, and the 0 0.85 factor. So if we push this through on our uh, calculator. We can just uh, show it up here. We had uh, 50 kilonewtons, so that's 5,000. Uh, that's actually uh, wrong. That was supposed to be 50 times 10 to the third. <coughs> uh, and then we have 10 megapascals, and we have 0 0.85. One thing that you'll see here, I always do this when I calculate, because it's a bit easier if you, if you see the connection. Uh, and that's the connection between megapascal and every everything else. So in this case, we have 100 bars, which is 10 megapascals. And mega, that's uh, 10 raised to the power of 6. So we could write it as 10 times 10 to the 6th Pascal. And we also know that Pascal is 10 to the 10 times uh, 10 to the 6th Newton per square meter. So that Pascal is Newton per square meter. But what we also can do is 10 megapascal equals 10 newton per square millimeter. And that is because 10 to the sixth, uh, we have, let's see, try to show it there. 10 to the 6th up top, and then we have meters squared below. If we want to do the meters squared in millimeters instead, so 1 meter equals 10 to the 3rd millimeters. 1 square meter equals 10 to the 3rd times 2 millimeters equals 10 to the sixth millimeters. So that means that we can put in a millimeter here, but then we have to add 
10 to the sixth below the dividing line also, which ends up just being per square millimeter instead. So we get 10 megapascal equals 10 newton per square millimeter, which is also one of the reasons why I'm always annoyed by uh, uh, the hydraulics industry always using square centimeters instead of square millimeters. So if they had used square millimeters, it would have been a lot easier to use this conversion when, when you're working on it. <coughs> but it's a bit up to yourselves what you want to do. Uh, I prefer using Newton up top and Newton per square millimeter below. That's going to give me millimeters directly in my uh, answer. So I get a diameter of approximately 27.4 millimeters on this one. Then we're of course going to, to uh, make it a bit bigger than that just to be on the safe side. And we'll round it off to, to the closest whole number uh, that we have. So 30 millimeters in diameter on this one. Might very well be that we need an even uh, larger uh, diameter on it because that, that's what's available when we actually start looking at cylinders, uh, physical cylinders that we can use in the system. But for now, when we're designing the system, 30 millimeters is going to, uh, to fit us uh, nicely as the diameter of our piston. <coughs> there, I'd forgotten a couple of uh, animations, I can see. <coughs> and then we need to determine the required flow rate of our uh, cylinder. So if we open page 402 again, in the uh, mechanical and metal trades handbook, because in the middle there we had piston speed, so we can start looking a little bit at that. So piston speed, and we're going to just zoom in on that one so we can see it a bit better. <coughs> and we can see here that piston speed, that's the uh, velocity, and it's equals to the flow rate divided by the area. And the area is of course the, the uh, comes from the diameter we just set uh, on the piston which means that we have uh, a desired velocity of 0 0.04 decimeters per second, which is 4 millimeters per second. It's just converted into decimeters. The reason I've converted it into decimeters is to have cubic decimeters, which is the same as liters, uh, when I get into the end here. It's often a bit easier to do conversions before you actually start plugging it in and getting uh, getting squares and cubes uh, on them. <coughs> uh, and if we convert it from second to minute, we also get 2.4 decimeters per minute. Uh, that just, that's just doing the uh, amount of seconds in a minute, uh, basically, and adding that in. <coughs> uh, the area with uh, 0 0.3 decimeters cube gives us 0 0.02 uh, decimeter squared, I mean, not decimeter cube. <coughs> and then we put it in for the flow rate, because it's the flow rate that we want to know. We, we know the velocity and we know the area. We just set the area ourselves and we have a desired velocity that we want. So we're going to get a flow rate from this, where we multiply our velocity with our area and we get 2.4 decimeters per minute multiplied with the area of 0 0.07 decimeters squared. So we get our 0 0.168 decimeters cubed per minute, which is 0 0.168 liters per minute. So approximately 0 0.2 liters per minute. <coughs> so now we need to, yeah? When we assume the, uh, the the velocity is the same as the one uh, uh, that was on sale that I saw, so so that was set from what that one was because we don't want if we get uh, too high of a velocity you have a uh, really high crushing uh, danger. So if if you get a hand caught in front uh, in front of the piston, then you if it's moving way too fast you have no chance to to react and and push the emergency stop button. So if it's moving slow enough, then uh, of course you're, you're going to damage your hand, but you're not going to crush it beyond uh, repair. So you're actually going to give the doctor something to work with to, to give you back your hand. 
So, so uh, there's a certain difference there. If it was, for an example, four decimeters a second, it would be shooting out, basically, instead of just slowly pushing. So we want a, a slow but steady push uh, on this one. The, the value was from the first, very first slide. So we set it to be four millimeters per second. So that, that was one of the uh, requirements of the cylinder, that it was to have a speed of four millimeters per second. <coughs> uh, but then there is also one thing we need to figure out. Uh, we need to figure out how thick uh, the piston rod needs to be in order to handle uh, all of this. And that is regards to, to it uh, snapping. Uh, so basically being bent out of shape and then snapping. <coughs> uh, so we need to open page 85 in the uh, textbook where we did one of the examples where we looked at piston diameters. <coughs> Since we don't have a specific uh, cylinder uh, that we, were, uh, we are looking at right now, we're just going to have to use what's available in, the, in our textbook. Uh, so that's why I'm using this one from the example. And here we can see different, different diameters of, uh, of piston rods uh, on lines here. And then we have the length of the piston rod down below and we have the force given vertically. And we're up at 50,000 Newton. So 50 kilonewtons up there. And we'll just check the maximum length of the first available piston rod. So we'll just see how, how long can that piston rod be safely. This one has the safety factors integrated into it, so we don't need to think about uh, adding safety factors on it. But if we go to the first available one, that's the 22 millimeter diameter piston rod. And that gives us approximately 320 millimeters. And that was the minimum length that we need. So if we have a piston rod diameter of 22 millimeters, it should be just enough to run this cylinder. If we want the cylinder to be even longer than 320 millimeters, then we're going to have to uh, go up to, for an example, 25 millimeters and look down here to see 400 millimeters length. So it depends a bit on how much longer uh, of a cylinder we want. <coughs> but for this one, uh, 22 should be uh, just enough to, to get it in, especially with regards to the safety factor already having been applied uh, into this, uh, into this uh, diagram, so that we, we know that it's already, uh, already safer uh, than that. It's going to be safe enough if it's uh, 22 millimeters in diameter. So then we'll sum up the cylinder. So we have a single acting cylinder with a spring return since it's horizontal. So we can't use gravity or anything like that to, to push it back. And we need a piston diameter of uh, 30 millimeters. If we should change the pressure for some reason, for an example, if it turns out that the, the <coughs> pump we end up choosing has 120 bars of uh, of operating pressure, it might be that we need a, a smaller cylinder uh, or a smaller piston. So that's something we're going to have to have to think about later on if if uh, anything ends up uh, being changed. <coughs> and we need a piston rod diameter of 22 millimeters in order to handle uh, the forces uh, it's going to be subjected to, which means that between the piston size of 30 millimeters and the piston piston rod, that's where we need to put in our, in our spring. So if we have our cylinder, we have the piston, which is 30 millimeters. And we have our piston rod of 22 millimeters. We don't really have all that much room to have a spring in there. So if we're going to have a spring in there, we can't really have much of a, much of a uh, larger piston rod. So uh, the, the, the there, there are slight limitations there. So if we need a longer cylinder, meaning that we need to increase the uh, diameter of our piston rod, 
then we're going to have to increase our piston diameter also in order to just have room enough to have that spring in there. And for now, we've just set our operating pressure to 100 bars. And we also have set a flow rate of 0 0.2 liters per minute, approximately. So after the break, we'll uh, start looking at the pump and dimensioning that one.
Right. Um, so we're going to need to need to figure out what pump we're going to have. So first off, we want to have the symbol for the pump into our our schematic. So again, we open page 393 in the Mechanical and Metal Trades Handbook or chapter 18 in the textbook. So that one also works. <coughs> and we're going to locate the fixed displacement hydraulic pump unidirectional symbol. So that's uh, the one we have over here, where we have uh, one direction shown by an arrow inside uh, a circle, so showing which way the, the hydraulic fluid is flowing. And we also have a rotational arrow just showing which way it's supposed to rotate in order to to have that uh, uh, have the flow go in that direction. <coughs> As you can see from many of the others, you can have variable displacement, and you have this uh, arrow that's slashing across our uh, circle, uh, and you even have arrows going both ways for rotation and both ways for flow. So you have quite a lot of different kinds of symbols that you can choose from w when you're uh, when you're selecting a pump, but a fixed displacement pump, which is only delivering flow in one direction, that's the, uh, that's the most basic one that we can have. So we put this one uh, in here. <coughs> and then we're going to start looking at the pump. So we need to figure out which pump we need. So, so what are the uh, requirements of our pump? What does it need to deliver for us? So we'll open up page 402 in the uh, Mechanical and Metal Trades Handbook, because then we have the lowest part here, which says power of pumps. So we locate the power of pumps part. I'll just zoom in on it a bit here to see it. <coughs> and then we'll just have a quick look at the schematic that they've set up here. So as you can see, they have the same symbol here. They've removed the uh, rotational arrow on this one. And they've also sort of created a connection between the, between the shafts, the shaft from the motor and the shaft of the, of the uh, pump. So we're going to do the same to our, our uh, symbol here. We're going to place it here. We're going to connect the shafts. And we're not going to bother with the, uh, with the uh, rotation of it anymore. We just have it like this. <coughs> then we'll start looking at uh, the calculations that we need to do uh, with regards to the pump. So P1 is going to be our input power, which comes uh, to the pump through the drive shaft that goes into it. And the drive shaft is connected to the shaft of the electric motor. <coughs> but as we said in the start, the electric motor has a power deliverance of 2 kilowatts, but also a mechanical efficiency of 99%. And since we have a mechanical efficiency of 99%, there's obviously uh, something missing in the fonts here. Uh, there's supposed to be a dot in the middle there for, for a multiplication. <laughs> That symbol is missing on this computer. <coughs> uh, so we have the mechanical efficiency, and we multiply it with the power from, from the electrical motor. That gives us 0 0.99 multiplied with 2 kilowatts, so we get 1.98 kilowatts that are delivered to our pump. <coughs> and it is highly unlikely that we're going to find a pump that has... Uh, 100 bars of operating pressure and only 0 0.2 liters per minute in flow rate. So we're going to have to choose one of them as our requirement, and then we're going to have to use uh, use valves afterwards to in order to uh, to control the other. So we assume uh, we assume the same pump efficiency as in the example here. In the example, we have 0 0.84. Ideally, we would have found a specific pump from uh, a supplier 
in the catalog and that would have given us the, uh, the efficiency that we needed. And we look at the calculation for efficiency over here. So we have the efficiency and it's the same as the output power from the pump divided by the input power of the pump. And so it means that only 84% of the power that you put into your pump is going to come out as hydraulic power. <coughs> so we calculate here, we figure out what P2 is supposed to be. P2 is the one that we deliver into our system. So we do the 0 0.84 uh, efficiency multiplied with 1.98 kilowatts. That means that we have approximately 1.66 kilowatts of hydraulic power entering our system. And the output power, we can calculate that by using the flow rate and the uh, operating pressure, which we have already sort of set for the cylinder. We, we've set 100 bars of operating pressure, and we've also calculated that we only need 0 0.2 liters per minute. The 600 down here is a conversion factor, and the 600 means that we can, can use kilowatts directly here. Uh, we can also use, uh, let's see, for the Q, we can use liters per minute. We don't need to uh, convert it to cubic meters per minute or anything like that. We can use liters per minute directly into it. And we can also use the pressure in bars. We don't need to convert it to Pascal. Uh, so by using this 600 conversion factor, as it says over here, we can put them in directly with the units that we already have. So it's a bit easier to do the calculation when we're doing it. So when we solve this one for flow rate, we're going to get uh, a pressure of 100 bars below here, PE, 100 bars. We have the 600 conversion factor and we have the 1.66 kilowatts in. And that gives us 10 liters per minute at 100 bars. So that's going to give us uh, quite a lot more than what we actually need uh, on that one. So potentially we're going to have to put in a, a flow meter here in order to, uh, not a flow meter, but a flow control valve in order to, to throttle it down to, to the correct uh, flow rate. But we'll also do the same calculation on output power, but now solve it for, for the uh, pressure. So if we actually set our flow rate to, uh, to the 0 0.2 liters per minute, we'll see what the operating pressure is going to end up. And we can see that we get 5,000 bars of operating pressure. And having a pump delivering 5,000 bars into a system in order to get 0 0.2 liters per minute, uh, and then having to use a pressure relief valve, to, to uh, a pressure reducing valve to get it down to 100 bars, that's uh, fairly far-fetched. I'm not even sure that you can find components that are capable of doing something like that. So it is pretty obvious from this that we're going to have to uh, just use the set pressure that we already set for a cylinder at 100 bars, and we're going to have to use a flow control uh, valve in order to, to control those 10 liters per minute and get them down to just 0 0.2 liters per minute. Because trying to control the pressure in this case, that's, that's not going to be possible. Or if it is possible, it's going to be very expensive components. So uh, it's, uh, it's not even worth it trying to, uh, trying to use it. <coughs> then we know that we, uh, we're, we're just going to have to accept that we are going to have a high flow rate and we're going to have to, to let uh, quite a lot of the flow return to the tank without being used I in, the, in the cylinder. <coughs> so we cross out the, the pressure one and we stay on with the other one. So a summary from the pump. The operating pressure is what's going to define our pump. So we need, uh, we need to find, go into catalogs from, uh, from suppliers and try to uh, figure out a pump that's going to deliver uh, an operating pressure of 100 bars and preferably uh, as low a, a flow rate as possible. So you, you will probably be able to find s very small pumps that deliver 100 bars and less than 10 liters per minute. But then you're sort of starting to walk into the, the very special types of pumps, which might be a bit more expensive or something like that, but 
mm, something that you, you could take into consideration for your s a system. In this case, we're creating a hypothetical uh, system, so we don't actually go into our, our uh, uh, suppliers and catalogs and, and look at that. <coughs> If uh, our pump, for an example, has 120 bars uh, as an operating pressure, but it has five liters per minute uh, uh, as a capacity, Uh, we could choose that one, but then we would, of course, need to put in a pressure-reducing valve so that we, we get the pressure down to 100 bars uh, in our system. <coughs> And we, of course, need to have a pressure relief valve in case of pressure peaks, so, so that uh, if we get a very high pressure every now and then, uh, especially when you're starting up everything, then you uh, need to have a pressure relief valve. These are usually built in to, uh, to the pumps, so... Uh, um It might, be, uh, might not be necessary to have one separately, uh, but that's going to be detailed in, in the catalog from, from a supplier if it's built in. And uh, we have to combine it with a flow control valve in this case in order to get, get the correct flow rate to the cylinder. So then we'll just look at a pressure relief valve just in case it's not uh, integrated into our pump. So then we're going to have to put one in ourselves. <coughs> And it is difficult to, to choose a particular pressure relief valve without having a specific pump to match it to. But we can put in the symbol into our schematic uh, anyway, because uh, the pressure relief valves have operating ranges. So for an example, One pressure relief valve might have an operating range from 80 bars to 120, and it's adjustable. Another might have from 100 bars to 140. And then it depends on what, uh, what uh, kind of pressure is your pump actually delivering. What's the operating pressure out from your pump? So if it's, uh, if it's 130, you're going to have to have the one that goes from 100 to 140, because the other one isn't going to be able to handle it. <coughs> Uh, but, but in this case, we're just going to, uh, going to put in the symbol so that we know that we are going to have to have something in there. And we'll find the symbol on page 393 in the blue book, but also in chapter 18. <coughs> And then we locate the pressure relief valve. So we have uh, a column here with pressure valves, and it's the pressure relief one. That's the top one there. And we can see that... It's a bit difficult to see it here, but we have uh, the arrow pointing downwards and the pilot pressure is coming from the entrance into the valve. So it's, it's reading off the pressure and if that pressure gets too high, then it's going to open up the valve and return flow to the tank. <coughs> uh, but we also want it to be adjustable. The one that's down here doesn't uh, have any uh, adjustability parts, so it's just set as one thing. So we're going to add... add this arrow up here, which is the adjustability arrow. And usually that arrow is added across the spring symbol so that it shows that the spring is adjustable. So we're going to put it into our schematic here. So you have the adjustability arrow going across the spring. And then you have when it, when it opens up, it's going to release directly into tank. So all of the all of the pressure above the operating pressure is going straight back I into the tank. We have uh, another one where I've forgotten it. So we have uh, a pressure relief valve, which we need to put in also. <coughs> no, it w uh, yeah, uh, it's a pressure gauge that we need to put into our uh, pressure relief valve. We don't need to, but it's nice to have it there uh, because when you have a pressure relief valve that it's adjustable, you're going to going to be adjusting it, it's nice to know that you're putting it to the correct, uh, uh, correct uh, pressure to open. So it's nice to be able to read it off directly. So in page 223 in the uh, hydraulics textbook, we get uh, this symbol for pressure gauge. <coughs> so we can put that one into our into our uh, schematic and we'll put it more or less directly above the uh, the pressure relief valve
Then we have the pressure reducing valve. We might not need this one if the operating uh, pressure of the pump is 100 bars then it's going to be enough with just the pressure relief one because it's going to handle all pressure peaks. But if we have 120, 130 uh, bars of operating pressure coming from the pump, we're going to have, uh, have to put in a pressure reducing valve in order to get, uh, get it down to 100 bars. And it needs to be connected to the pump, the pressure gauge, and the pressure relief valve. So after all of those, <coughs> And it's going to, to find it here in uh, page 393 of the blue book. Again, down here with the pressure valves, but now it's one of the others. And uh, before we connect them, we also need to, uh, to, to put in lines connecting everything. So we'll be using the working line type. So this one, that's a, that's a uh, what's it called? Not a dotted line, but it's a uh, continuous line. That was the word I was looking for. <coughs> and also the line junctions, uh, which this book uses is there. Where it uses these, these dots to, to connect it when, when it's connecting uh, several lines. So now we're going to connect these together, and then we're going to put the pressure reducing valve into place also. <coughs> so again we're in here we have this part with the pressure valves and we're going to locate a two-way pressure regulator direct acting down here <coughs> it is almost the same symbol as the one we have up here but now the pilot line is connected to the uh, the outlet of the valve so it's it's uh, reacting to the pressure that's coming out of the valve. If that pressure gets too high, it's going to close off the valve until the pressure is reduced. <coughs> so if we put it in here, it's a bit easier to see our symbol then. So we have it sending our, uh, our hydraulic pressure up here. And if the pressure going through this pilot line becomes too much, it's going to push the slide in so that it closes off and it's going to be sending the, the spare amount of, uh, of fluid directly back to the tank. So, uh, so uh, whenever it closes off, it has a direct opening to the tank so that you don't get a, a, uh, a buildup of pressure on this side. <coughs> and then we also connect it uh, to the rest of the system. So now we have the motor, we have a pump, we have the pressure relief valve in case we get high pressure peaks. That would uh, be typically if, uh, if something happens in the, uh, in the um, electrical grid so that we get a, a spike from our uh, uh, motor so, so that the motor suddenly um, goes a bit faster than what it's supposed to do. Uh, then it's going to create a pressure peak inside the, inside the pump. So the pump is going to send much higher pressure in here and the pressure relief valve is going to open up and release that pressure. And at the same time, we also have the pressure reducing valve that is making sure that only 100 bars passes past that point. So if, if we had wanted to, we could have had a pressure gauge connected to the, to the other side of the uh, pressure reducing valve also, just to make sure that we, we set it to the correct, uh, uh, correct pressure. So uh, usually what they what they put in is just uh, connection points so that you can come in with a, uh, a pressure gauge and just connect it while you're adjusting and then you're going to disconnect it afterwards. So, uh, so in that initial phase when you're sort of testing the system and setting it up, th then you have pressure gauges connected but then you take them off because pressure gauges also cost, cost money and if this is a product that you're going to sell to someone and the uh, pressures only need to be set once no one is going to be fiddling about with uh, any of the valves or anything, then you just need to set it in your factory where you're producing the system. <coughs> so you don't need to send the pressure gauges off with, with it. Now we need to think about controlling the flow uh, of our system. So we need to put in the flow control valve and <coughs> Uh, we most likely need to, to be throttling it quite a lot. 
well, according to our calculations, 9.8 liters per minute needs to be uh, redirected uh, back to the tank. So that's quite a lot. Uh, so we are going to have to use one that has a relief opening to tank. So, so uh, if it had been like 0 0.2 uh, liters per minute that was supposed to be th throttled, we might not have needed to, to have, uh, have that uh, opening uh, back to tank. But uh, in this case, where absolutely most of our fluid is going back to the tank, we want, we want that opening. It's going to save our pump quite a lot of work, uh, so it won't, won't strain it. So page 393 again in the blue book. And we'll go into the flow control valves down here. And we have an adjustable three-way flow control valve with relief opening to tank. So it even says, says everything uh, in the book there uh, that it has. <coughs> So we're going to put that one into our system here. And we can see this is the throttling uh, symbol, those two, those two curves. And we have an uh, adjustment arrow going through it so that it's an adjustable one. So we can set it to a certain amount of uh, flow rate. <coughs> and it also has this connection point where it's going to send, uh, send off uh, uh, the uh, extra fluid back to the tank. <coughs> so we connect it to the uh, pressure reducing valve. And now we need a directional control valve in order to, to figure out how we're going to control our, our uh, 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 cylinder. Uh, but first off, I can just mention one thing here. Since we're using a pressure gauge to sort of set the, the pressure valves uh, to the correct part, uh, some of you might be wondering, should we then use a flow meter here in order to ensure that we have 0 0.2 liters per minute in it? But we don't really need to do that because what we're going to do is we're going to run the system. We're going to throttle it almost all the way to, uh, to closed. And then we're going to run the cylinder out while we are using a stopwatch. So for that initial setting of, of that one, it is enough to make sure that once we have run it uh, 10 seconds, we have 40 millimeters of movement on, on the piston. So, uh, so just by adjusting it, running it once while we uh, take the time, then we'll, uh, we'll see. Maybe we need to adjust it a little bit more, and then we'll run it once more while we check the time. And then once we hit the point where we get 40 millimeters in 10 seconds, then we are going to get it, uh, have it set completely. And <coughs> Even though these are adjustable, they won't be, uh, it won't be possible for the customer who buys this product to, to adjust them. So, so they will most likely be encased inside a housing or something. So no one is going to see these valves. It's only the, the technicians in, in the workshop putting them together that sees them. <coughs> but we also need the directional control valve because whoever is operating this log splitter, he needs to, needs to have a button to push in order for the uh, cylinder to extend and actually split this log. <coughs> so then we'll use a directional control valve. And we don't have that many good ones uh, shown in, in uh, the blue book. So we're using the, the textbook instead on that one. Where we have, for an example, this one, where we have a three two-way valve in normally closed position. So we would want it to be normally closed because we want it only to act while someone is pushing the button. That, that is the uh, best way of uh, running a log splitter, that someone is actively running it while it's running so that you can't accidentally catch something inside it. You, you, you are aware of what you're doing when you're pushing that button. Uh, and when, once you release the button, you are also releasing the pressure so that uh, it can return. And that's what's happening uh, on this one, where we have normal closed, so the pressure line is closed, but uh, the cylinder is open to the tank so that the spring is allowed to just push, push the cylinder back and uh, move all of the fluid back to the tank. <coughs> so we're going to put this directional control valve in here, and we can connect it. Suddenly lost the T there, but there was supposed to be a T there. <coughs> And 
but we also need to be able to control this one uh, somewhere. We need to be able to actuate uh, the cylinder. And I've already been talking about having a button to push, so that, that's the uh, that's the sort of obvious way of of running uh, a tool like this is to have a physical button to push. And then we'll go into page 219 in the textbook where it has uh, several different ways of uh, actuation uh, to put in. And we want something we can press on in order to, to open it up. So the by pressing one. And we also want it to be returned uh, by means of a spring. So that if you push the button and you split the log, then when you release the button, it's go going to return. So you don't need to manually do anything in order to return this one. <coughs> so we're going to put in a push button and a spring return for it. Yeah, that was uh, everything for that system. So I think we'll just leave off there. You have uh, a lecture with Torbjorn also later on, so I'll give you 15 more minutes of spare time before, before his uh, lecture. <laughs> So that you get a uh, time to get some fresh air, maybe, and uh, clear your minds a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, everyone, have lots of fun on the course tomorrow and on the Thursday, whichever group you are in, uh, and uh, enjoy it. Uh, it sounds really, really fun and interesting. So. <laughs>